welcome to this uh, training event, which is dedicated to copyright, a very important topic, which was found uh, of uh, primary importance uh, by our consortium uh, and uh, uh, was requested <laughs> Uh, as a specific topic for training. Uh, maybe most of you already know that uh, we are organizing these uh, events uh, about open science and the EOSC as part of uh, um, a task of uh, VP6 of the triple project. VP6 is dedicated to open science and the EOSC. Uh, uh, and the integration of triple within the EOSC. And we dedicated specific efforts uh, to train uh, our consortium member and external uh, researchers uh, to specific topics related to open science. Um, this is the, 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 the last, uh, event of our training series. And you find uh, mm, at the following links you, you see in the slide. So in our uh, YouTube channel and uh, on Zinodo and uh, on Daria campus, all the recordings of and the slides of the uh, previous events. We had 11 events. Mm, and as I said, this is the last event we are organizing within this uh, series. Uh, I'm uh, going to give you some information about today's webinar. Uh, as you saw, this uh, session will be recorded and will be made available uh, afterwards uh, on the channels uh, um, I linked before. And uh, uh, we will have a, a question and answer session. I don't know if at the end or during the, 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 the webinar, mm, but remember that questions are very welcome and you can send them in the chat during the webinar. Uh, and of course, we will collect them and present to our speaker. So uh, our speaker of today is Professor Katerina Sganga. I'm very, very pleased to welcome her uh, here. Uh, Katerina is associate professor in comparative private law at the Santana School of Advanced Studies in Pisa, in Italy. And uh, her main areas of expertise are European and international copyright law, inter, um, intellectual property and human rights, and intellectual property and access to knowledge. And Katerina is also project coordinator of the project, uh, uh, Horizon 2020 project, uh, Recreating Europe. I give the floor to Katerina. Uh, so I stop sharing my screen so as to enable her to uh, start with the presentation. And thanks a lot, Katerina, for being with us today. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, Francesca, for the very kind introduction and for your invitation to deliver this webinar. I'm really pleased to be here with you this afternoon. The task uh, uh, is not one of the easiest, I must say, because uh, uh, copyright is uh, quite of a complex uh, topic, and for uh, uh, academics or for people uh, uh, handling uh, copyright uh, in, uh, in academia. Uh, that's something that is actually very important. So um, the title of my presentation of uh, today, I hope you can actually see my screen, is Copyright in Academia in the Digital Era. The, um, let me see. Okay, can you see the slide? Wonderful, perfect. So um, when we discussed how to frame uh, this, uh, uh, this seminar, how to deliver something that could be of good use for all of you, um, I tried to figure out how to frame it in a way that I give you both the foundations of what copyright is, how it works, what are the rights that are conferred to authors, how much it lasts, what are the balancing tools to make sure that the incentive that is given to credit production via the exclusivity 
is uh, takes also into account conflict and interest and rights or exceptions. And then also to give you some snapshots of the way how you can actually transfer or assign your rights if you're the one creating or how you can do it to keep your content fully uh, open. Now, since the content is in fact quite dense, we can opt for um, two different approaches. So one, which I would actually probably rather prefer is that you interrupt me at any time you have a question, simply because I'm going through very detailed topics. Not, even if I will do a sort of an helicopter view on certain things, it would make sense, I believe, if you simply touch base and interrupt me, if there is something that doesn't sound uh, reasonable for you or you have any doubts. So if it's about clarifying aspects that are not clear, just uh, uh, interrupt me at any time and I will be happy to address all the questions. If afterwards you have any particular curiosity you would like more generally to be addressed, then I will leave, say, approximately 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the uh, of the class so that we can address those uh, um, those particular questions you may have. And if we don't have enough time, we'll bring it offline and I will uh, remain available at any time for you. If that's fine as a, as a structure for you all, if no objections are made to this course of action, uh, that's the roadmap of the next uh, hour and uh, uh, say 10 minutes. So. I will show you what changed for with the digital revolution in copyright to give you a sense of why I'm talking about copyright in the digital era. That's something completely different than copyright in the material world. I will show you these basic sources and foundations of copyright from the material to the digital environment. I'm going to go quite fast. So you don't have to be uh, sort of overwhelmed and get scared for the fact that on the slides you will find much more materials than what I'm going to discuss. The material is there for your future reference afterwards. But what I'm going to discuss with you are just really the basics, the principles which I would like you to absorb uh, first of first thing first. Um, after sources and foundation, which I will analyze in a comparative manner, showing to you the different layers of regulation from the international speech, the European, and I will use Italy as a point of reference, merely for the fact that I'm Italian, I could have picked France or Germany with the very same uh, effort. I will show you some particular uh, efforts that the European legislator uh, made uh, recently for the purpose of preservation of cultural heritage, access for people with disability, uh, lending, so um, electronic lending, orphan works and out of commerce works to increase availability of works for uh, general access to knowledge purposes and also for uh, us academics uh, by the same token. Then I will move to conclude uh, to some uh, uh, brief overview on questions of economic exploitation of academic works. So the way how you can actually distribute uh, commercialize or make available your work, with which tools you can do it. So that's the menu for today. It's absolutely overly ambitious that I'm going to cover everything in detail. But again, that's just to give you a touch. So to, for you to be aware of the world out there and what you, be care, should, you should be careful of. And then for details, uh, there will be, I believe, time. So what changed with the digital revolution? With the digital revolution, basically, we got in front of uh, completely uh, a complete switch in the format of original works. Works before were on paper, now the support changed. You have hybrid works that have different characteristics. They are either all digital or they actually coexist in terms of functions that they can perform. You have texts that are now hyperlinked, uh, they might be blended with other type of works like audiovisual supports and so forth. So which the way how the work, the object of copyright was conceptualized changed in nature. At the same time, we also have new works that are covered by copyright. You have databases, electronic databases, you have software, you have new works that were not really existing before like machine generated content, AI generated content, user generated content. So this created new objects for copyright. But also the move to the internet and the digitization triggered a lot of new risks for right holders. Why? Simply because now to copy a protected work, 
doesn't cost anything. You can do it fast. You can do it in a potentially massive manner. And the quality of a file doesn't deteriorate compared to think about a photocopy of a book or of an article before that. The more you copied it and the more it got deteriorated. So while copying becomes easier, also distribution becomes less costly, fast, potentially massive, without border over the internet, and anonymized. Because you don't have to sell the copy directly. You can actually distribute it online. So piracy, so the possibility for exclusive rights, for copyright owners to see their economic rights wounded, put at risk, are much higher in the digital environment. As a cherry on the cake, also, the actors and the channel of distribution of works changed. Now you don't have direct sale anymore. You have platforms. You have uh, intermediaries taking care of selling you products. Think about Amazon. But think also about peer-to-peer -peer system of sharing. Now it's easier to distribute the very same work on different geographic location and discriminate on price depending on the type of work you sell. You not, not anymore just a paperback or hard uh, copy, but any other type of format may be priced different. You have new actors playing a role in the distribution, like databases, search engines, other indexing tools. So there are many more new actors in the copyright arena that were not considered before. And also how our habits of consumption changed. Now we like to get on-demand services, we prefer to download or to stream content. There is much more decentralization of, uh, of consumption of what can be considered as a protected work. Now, all these changes meant different things for the legal system. So for, for the law, that meant that basically new conducts, new objects were not really fitting into previous exclusive rights anymore. So you didn't have any more tools that could be well applied to this new context. Exceptions, so the previous balance between conflicting rights didn't work anymore because exceptions like private copy or other forms of flexibilities to make copyright more user-friendly became much more dangerous for, pri for piracy risks. And it became much more complicated also to enforce copyright. So to find the presence of infringement, to run against them, and to make sure that copyright is not infringed. So also copyright owners start in developing new tools and have new reaction against this change in the environment. They started imposing technological measures of protections on their files to control privacy, sorry, piracy on a private basis. So without going to a judge anymore, they modernized their business model and they started differentiating, uh, sometimes even drastically, their way of handling different works and different markets. Also, academic publishing changed as a consequence of this uh, revolution. You got a much greater centralization of uh, distribution of uh, academic works. So you got a sort of uh, uh, consolidation of what may be understood as oligopolies of proprietary data databases and drastic increase in prices. You got now handling of uh, research products through very restrictive end user license agreements, which are typically those you enter into when you accept using a database containing academic materials. And you got also into the spiral of uh, um, international research assessment indexes, age index, citation score, impact factor, that basically polarize the attention and, uh, and the offer of academic uh, works through specific journals via, via specific channels and in the hands of those managing those indexes. Think about Scopus connected to Elsevier as an example. You got the advent of predatory publishers, and you also got, as a in a certain sense, as a positive side, uh, but also negative for the way how it was handled at the end, open access. So everything that was connected to making products, not anymore, research products, not anymore shielded by proprietary uh, databases, but open to the public. But that entailed, we will see it at the end of this class, hopefully, also the birth or the development of new forms of new business models by the very same proprietary publishers, where actually is not anymore the consumer of content, but the producer of content. We should pay 
in order to have his or her work distributed openly and not within or behind the wall of uh, the paywall of a proprietary database. Once again, if I'm going too fast, if I'm saying things that don't make sense, just interrupt me at any time. Otherwise, I will run as a fast speed train. The reaction of the legal system in front of all uh, this uh, was actually very articulated. We got a plethora of new acts of changing copyright from the inside out. And it was not just a matter of national reaction, but this, time, this change was handled at the supranational level. You got international treaties pushing states to harmonize copyright in its basics, in its foundations, to react to the digital revolution in specific manner. That meant that basically national legislators got their hands blocked. They couldn't really do any more what they wanted with their own copyright laws, and they didn't have any more policy uh, uh, room to adapt their copyright law to their own social, cultural, and economic needs locally. And that was particularly evident for the impact that this standardization had on developing countries, much more than what happens in the developed world. What was the main thread which you see, and you will see it when I will discuss briefly with you the foundations of copyright. Basically, long story short, exclusive rights, so the rights that are conferred to copyright owners became broader, became stricter in their enforcement. And at the same time, they got even protected on top via technological measures of protections. So now when uh, the owner of copyright imposes on a file a technological measure of protection that makes it impossible for you, for example, to print the file or to make more than one copy or to save it on more than one device. While before you could actually crack the code and use uh, uh, some sort of uh, circumventing the devices uh, to circumvent this measure. Now, if you try to do it, you are sanctioned by the law, not just anymore by private enforcement, which means that we, the copyright owner got a second layer of protection on top of exclusive rights. As, a, as another consequence of this standardization, those balancing tools, those exceptions, which we will see in a moment, got reduced in number, and they are now interpreted narrowly because of the fear that they may trigger piracy. So you got a tilt in the copyright balance that before was much more user-friendly and now became more and more, uh, more and more uh, copyright owner-friendly than it was before. This is something which we may look at, at positively if we are the owner of copyright and not necessarily the author, but publisher or a commercial right holder, but that's not what we can look at nicely if we are either consumer of so users of protected works because access became much more complicated and much more costly. And we are not happy either if we don't enjoy too much the idea of having proprietary settings and not have a free distribution of the knowledge we produce as academics. Elements which are still to be noted is that now more and more, everything is regulated by contract. So it's not the law anymore that tells you what's right and what's wrong, but your privileges as user, your privilege as author vis-a-vis -vis, uh, producers and so forth is- Sorry, every Katerina. Yes? I think we have some problems with the audio. So maybe you can try to close your video so as to have a better connection. Let's try this yeah. way because sometimes we have some... Can you hear me better now? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so thanks, sorry for that. If there is uh, something that was not clear, just let me know. Okay, so um, as I was saying, there was actually ample room left for private autonomy. And uh, uh, at the same time, the legislator also started engaging into uh, providing uh, new uh, rules, uh, regulating areas that were completely uncovered before or uh, pretty much uncovered before, which were positive to get more access to protected works. I'm referring to, and we will see, legislations in the field of orphan works, out-of-commerce works, geo-blocking, 
the right for people with disability to get access to works in accessible format and so on. So all in all, it's true that copyright became uh, um, much more toughly enforced uh, uh, right than it was before, but we also have luckily some counterbalancing reaction by the legislator that introduced more access related tools. Now, what I'm going to do with you is to show you how copyright is regulated and what changed before and after the digital revolution. I give us granted that you don't know much about copyright, but if I'm getting boring because I'm telling things which you actually know, you simply interrupt me and tell me, okay, just skip this part, we are aware of that, okay? So I take as a ground the fact that you are mostly unaware about the basics of copyright. Should this not be the case, you let me know and I will get into a more, say, sophisticated helicopter view. Okay, so as I told you, uh, this is really a tangle of different regulations. So you don't just have national laws telling you what copyright should look like, but most of the pillars of copyright are regulated at an international level. You got a number of international treaties uh, where member states are almost all the countries of the world uh, giving us the pillars of copyright, so the basics of its, of its regulations. If you operate in Europe, then you also have the European legislator uh, that intervened on copyright, probably uh, the most intensively compared to any other field of private law. We have approximately 20 directives and regulations in the field of copyright. That is something you don't even see in consumer protection law. Quite astonishing considering how small the subject is. What I will do with you is to show you how these two supranational sources regulate copyright. And then we will have a look at Italy as an example of national legislation to see how certain rules are implemented. And I will compare it to a system that is quite different than ours, the United States. Why? Because they represent a copyright model that is different than the continental tradition, so the European tradition we are used to. So to show you also that something else also exists. Now, first thing I wanted to discuss with you is the subject. Then I will move to the object. So what, which works are protected? I will show you which rights are granted to uh, copyright owners and what, ex what the exceptions are, how long the copyright lasts and so forth. So actually who's the author is not something that these laws really define. When you move around national laws, basically the key principle you need to keep in mind is that differently than other intellectual property rights, copyright is not registered. So you get it, you acquire it, simply for the mere fact of creation. Once you jot down on a paper some thoughts of yours, you have copyright on those thoughts from the very moment when you created it. If, of course, the work is original. This means that who's the author? If nowhere his work is registered, the author is the person who appears as such on the work or is announced as such on the work. Also, if it's covered by a pseudonym or art name or the like. So as you see, it's something that it's not formalized, but it comes uh, out of custom simply because that's a right, which you don't get because you register the work, but simply from the mere fact of the creation. When you have a collective work, so a work that is made by more, uh, more than one person, is the person who directs and organizes the creation. Think about the uh, editor of an edited book who gets the, uh, the copyright on it. Another very interesting point, which you find basically all across different states, is that when you have more than one author for the same piece, the ownership of that piece is shared as you would share the ownership of a real estate, of a flat or, or a piece of land. So co-ownership, the rules on co-ownership from private law apply exactly as they are on copyright. Of course, we are talking about economic rights, moral rights, so the rights to be recognized as an author, the paternity or the integrity, which we will see in a snap, can also be exercised individually because they are rights connected to personality. But all rights that are purely economic they are under co-ownership. So they are regulated per quota exactly as if the protected work would be a flat. 
then if the work is anonym or pseudonym, the right can be exercised only by the publisher or the performer until the real author comes out. Because of course, if the work is anonym or pseudonym, then you don't know who the author is. In not all states, uh, but in some states like Italy, also the state and local administration may be owner of the copyright on works that they financed. And the same applies to universities, which might own collections of works which were published under their funding. You don't really have a definition of who the author is at the European level. And in fact, the, the definition of who the author is is not standardized across the EU. But what it, I think it's worth noting is that more or less we tend to have harmonization across the world. If you look at different legislations of EU member states, but even if you move to the United States, the definition of uh, uh, single authorship, co-ownership of different authors, collective works is very similar to what I described to you until now in Italy. So we can say that this is really a sort of basic principle that is shared across the globe. What is not completely shared instead is which words works are protected. Why? Well, because of course, the point is that what is not protected by copyright falls immediately in the public domain. So once it's created, it's not covered by copyright. So defining the external boundaries of this notion of protected works is quite important to define what the public domain is. So which are those works, those pieces we can use for free? Now, if you look at an international level, the basic uh, act, which is the Bern Convention of 1883, so not really yesterday, offers a definition of protected works as literary and artistic works, whatever might be the mode and form of their expression. So no matter if they are on a support, if they are oral or written, literary and artistic works are covered by copyright. Afterwards, there is a list, a description of examples, which is considered to be non-exhaustive. So it's just exemplificative. And they refer to books, poems, they look at also music, they look at everything that is artistic from paintings to sculptures, work of architecture, photographs and the like. So the list is quite long, but it's exemplificative, which means that if something is a literary or artistic production, musical included, scientific included, it falls within the scope of copyright. That's a notion that gets expanded. Under the same notion, you also have adaptations and translations of original works. What does that mean? That if I'm the author of a work and someone translates this work, I should authorize it. But then the translator will be the author and the owner of copyright over the translation. So I have the right to authorize translations, but who translates afterwards, after you got the authorization, will be the owner of copyright on the translation because those are independent works. You may have copyright also on collections. So encyclopedias, anthologies, if they are original in their arrangement. And it might be, but that depends state from state, that even design, so like furniture design or car design or uh, any type of, uh, of industrial object design uh, is covered by copyright and not by other rights. Now, if you look around, so if you look in national laws, and as I told you, don't bother about what's on the slide because uh, you will get the slides afterwards. It's, now we are just discussing principles. So for you to get a sense of what, of what the pillars of copyright are, most of the national laws really follow what the Berne Convention said. So they basically uh, cover broad range of creative works and they refer to categories such as literature, music, figurative arts, architecture, theater, cinematography, just to give a sense of the content, but those are examples. So they are not considered to be fixed categories that cannot be broadened. And again, doesn't matter what the mode of expression is. From the 90s of last century, copyright was also expanded to cover software and databases. 
in a very specific manner. Of course, in an hour, I won't have time to give you details on how specific the regulation of these two categories uh, is, uh, but it's very interesting, particular with, particularly with regard to databases. Something on which states really are different is whether or not official text and acts by state and public administrations are covered by copyright. In Italy and in most member states of the European Union, official works are not protected by copyright. So they fall outside the scope of copyright. Like they are in the public domain. Think about laws, judicial and administrative acts, uh, proceedings from parliaments and so forth. But there are countries like, for example, the United Kingdom, where a court's decision is crown copyright. So it's the copyright of the crown. What you have in certain countries and not in others is a much clearer distinction between what can and cannot be protected by copyright. I tell you, for example, there are countries, I imagine like the Netherlands or Sweden, Germany is one of them, that makes it clear that uh, basic facts, basic news, data, information, so rough material that doesn't entail creativity is not protected by copyright. This means that you have what is called the idea expression dichotomy. What does that mean? That expressions are protected by copyright, creative expressions are protected by copyright, but not the ideas that underline it. Usually to my students, to make them remember this dichotomy, I make the example of Romeo and Juliet. Why? Because I guess that if you close your eyes, you can at least recall 10 different romances or movies or poems using the typical plot of uh, two lovers who can't get married, can't really love each other uh, freely because the two families hate each other. And then it finishes dramatically. Now, this is Romeo and Juliet, but it, the plot, the idea underlying it, has been heavily copied by uh, a lot of different authors. And that's completely okay, because it's not the idea, it's not the plot that is protected by copyright, but it's the way how this plot is expressed, the creative expression that bears the touch of the single author. So that's what we mean when we say idea expression dichotomy. And that's why, Basic facts, basic news, basic data cannot be protected by copyright, are not protected by copyright. In the European Union, if you search for a harmonization, that is actually not the definition of what protected works is. And if you travel around the globe, and I bring you again the example of the United States, it's very general definition, very broad definition, looks always the same. Original work of authorship. In the United States, they want it to be fixed. So it should be on a material support in order to be protected. Otherwise, the definition is always the same. And just to give you a sense of how dangerous is this open definition, there were cases coming from the Netherlands, uh, now finally shut down by the Court of Justice of the European Union, where the Supreme Court of the Netherlands admitted the possibility to protect via copyright the smell of a parfum or the taste of a cheese was considered to be an original creative expression. Then luckily the Court of Justice of the European Union stated that a taste and a smell cannot be objectively represented, objectively expressed in a way that me and you can distinguish it from other things. So this would create too much uncertainty on what is protected, and for this reason, they cannot be protected. But still, for the fact that this definition of protected work is so broad, uh, if you ask me what is protected by copyright, I can actually tell you what is not protected by now by copyright, rather than the contrary. So to define this category, we can do it a contrario. So while looking at what's not protected, it's a very expansive category. How do you acquire copyright? How do you get it? As I told you, by means of creation. And at an international level, it's forbidden to the member states of the Berne Convention, which are more than 180 countries, uh, to introduce any formality for the acquisition of those rights. So it's forbidden to do it. So much that you don't have any reference to formalities anywhere, and you don't find a single law telling you how do you acquire copyright. 
There were countries like the United States where instead registration was required. A copyright notice with the C was required, publication and deposit at the Library of Congress was required. They were not member of the Berne Convention until 1989. That's why they could afford having these formalities. Now what they did, that, that is a typical American trick, uh, they generally do it when they adhere to international conventions, was that they kept what they have and they simply said that it doesn't buy. So you still need to put C on your, um, the C of copyright on your publication. Otherwise, uh, you, can't you can't actually sue anyone for infringement because they, have, they may have the defense of, I didn't know that it was protected by copyright. You, you should still publish and you should still register and deposit. Otherwise, either you're subject to a fine or you cannot claim your rights in court. So basically you have a right that cannot be enforced, but formally they don't have formality any longer. Any question or comments until now? All clear? Wonderful. So now the question is, and I pose, a, this is a rhetoric question to you. Okay, but if there are no formalities of protection, then, then basically everything can be protected. There are no requirements. Not true. Not all works can be protected. In order to be protected, those works should be creative, original, new, and they should be externalized. What does that mean? Well, that very much depends on the country where you are from, but basically creativity means that the work should be the author's own intellectual creation. So this is a sort of buzzword, a buzz definition used at the European level. What does that mean? It means that the work carries the touch of the author and it's the product of uh, their own creative choice. So it shouldn't be something that is forced by technical reasons. It's not something that it's uh, slavishly copied from someone else and so forth. Of course, this notion of originality depending on whether you read it subjectively or objectively, may or may not overlap with creativity. All in all, the requirement is very low. So if you ask me, practically speaking, apart from this blah, blah, blah of definition, what does that mean? Well, it means that basically everything is protected as long as it's not slavishly copied from someone else and is not dictated by technical needs. So the, re the originality threshold to have a work protected is very, very, very low. It's not like patent. It's not like other intellectual property rights. And let me add on top another element. Now, if you don't have registration, so if you don't actually have uh, an office or an agency from the state verifying uh, whether these requirements are met, well, it goes without saying that you actually don't know if a work is protected or not, until you end up in court. So until you sue someone for infringement as the copyright owner, and that this someone who was sued counterclaims or defend themselves by saying, if I know I'm not infringing anything, you're not protected by copyright. That will be the moment when the court will analyze whether the work is original enough to be protected. Otherwise, you don't know in advance if copyright on the particular work exists. You have a presumption of existence, but no one said that it's actually the case. And now we move to the rights. Which rights are granted to the copyright owner? What are your rights? Well, this is what changed before and after the digital revolution. Forget about the international definition, which is the most confusing thing you can see because at an international level, they define the rights on the basis of the work. That is an absolutely upside down way of conceiving them. Let me show you an example, which is Italy. This is, we can say, the French model. So all countries that copied the legislation from the French, which was the case for Italy, have this very same model, had it, sorry before the 2000s, so before the digital revolution kicked in. You have a very broad rule that tells you that actually the copyright owner can exploit the work economically in any form, in any place, original or the right. Of course, within the limits of the law. But what does that mean? What can I do? What can I prevent other people from doing? 
Well, basically, we are talking about copying. Just think about, you, you call it copyright, which is the right to copy, that it, it stays inside the, the very same definition. Of the right. So the very first right you have is the right to reprodu reproduce. So to prevent other people from copying your work. It can be temporary, it can be partial, doesn't matter. It covers everything. It's a very absorptive, absorb, absorptive right. It covers all type of reproductions, temporary, uh, partial, ephemeral, and so on. It should be on a material support. And it doesn't matter if afterwards you distribute those works or not, the reproduction is forbidden. Um, back in time to transcribe something was also, by hand, of course, was also considered to be an important right to be covered by exclusivity. Uh, representation in public, performance in public of a work is protected by copyright. Not if you do it with the ordinary circle of your family and friends, though. Transmit via television, telegraph, radio, TV. So broadcasting immaterially in a distant communication is covered by copyright. Distribution in commerce is covered by copyright. The difference between distribution and other rights is that distribution in commerce gets exhausted after the first sale. What does that mean? It means that once you sell for the first time your work, then you cannot control anymore any secondhand sale. That's because the legislator decided that differently than any other exclusive rights, which the copyright owner keeps with themselves, uh, the distribution right gets exhausted after the first sale so that consumers may benefit from secondary markets, so from second-hand markets. Also, the rights to translate, to modify, to adapt the work are covered by copyright. So these are the rights, how they were traditionally defined before the digital revolution. In time, particularly in the 90s, they expanded this list by adding also rental and lending. Why? Because there were sectors like video cassettes, books and whatever, where renting, when lending, actually eroded the original market of the work. So it was in competition with the original market, the first-hand sale of the work. So since you had the exhaustion of the distribution right to compensate, they gave to copyright owners also the right to rent and the right to lend their work. One thing you should always keep in mind, these rights are a bundle, like a bouquet of single flowers, you can sell them separately, you can license them separately, and as a user, you can violate them separately. They are independent, one from the other, and they can uh, refer to the entire work, but also to single pieces of it, okay? Now, these are the economic rights. If you move to the European Union, those rights were basically standardized only at the level of rental and lending, and if you go, we, again, with an helicopter view all across the uh, different world countries, you will find more or less the very same definitions. The preparation of derivative works, the production, distribution, performance, display are all covered by, uh, by copyright. These are economic rights before the digital revolution. After the digital revolution, as I told you at the very beginning of this class, we got the introduction at an international level of new rights. So what they did was that basically, uh, just wait a second. I'm sorry, there was an amazing noise from outside and I couldn't hear myself anymore. So sorry for that. Uh, in the digital, uh, with the digital revolution, uh, they introduced an international treaty, the WIPO Copyright Treaty, to standardize those new rights that basically uh, summarized and put under just three umbrella all potential users of protected work 
in the digital environment. I am referring to the distribution right, to rental right, and to communication to the public. Basically, what they did was that they decided to split material from immaterial exploitation of the work. Everything that is material, so a material sale of a work, stays under distribution. So material support and sale equal distribution. Everything else that happens online, from streaming to downloading to uh, mere uh, making available to the public, it's all covered by communication to the public. So no matter how you do it, online, on a television, on a radio, if it's immaterial and if it's a transmission, which can be originated by uh, someone or on demand from you, that's all covered by communication to the public. They didn't decide to harmonize also reproduction because they consider reproduction to be quite a straightforward right. So they said, okay, you do what you want, member states. This is something you all have in the same manner, so we don't need to standardize it internationally. What happened afterwards was that since the European Union was a member of this treaty, we got uh, actually uh, a directive in 2001, the InfoSoc directive, that now created a sort of European code of copyright and standardized those rights all across the union. They decided to introduce uh, the reproduction, reproduction right. So, so now you have a very broad reproduction right that is direct, indirect, temporary, permanent, in any manner of form and blah, 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 blah. And you have communication to the public and distribution. So these are now the three rights that cover everything. And all member states, now, instead of the patchwork, which I showed before, have these three rights. Of course, they also have performance and display if it's a work of art. So minor rights, rights which were conceptualized differently are still out there. But by being still out there, that doesn't mean that they are not harmonized. It doesn't mean that they don't all revolve around this basic tripartite distinction. Any question or comments until now? Wonderful, I hope that this means that everything is clear. So to balance these exclusive rights, which are granted to uh, authors uh, and right holders in general, of course, you need to have some exceptions. So some free users that are still allowed uh, because they represent needs, uh, private or public, that are there to protect public interest or conflicting rights of users. Forget about the exceptions at an international level. What I wanna show you is what actually happened in time. There were certain exceptions, uh, very close to list, uh, very specific at the national level before the intervention of the supranational standardization. What we have today is with the digital revolution, a shopping list of approximately 20, yeah, 21 exceptions, one of them mandatory, that are now more or less standardized at the level of the EU. If you look at them, they are all exceptions to reproduction or exceptions to reproduction and communication to the public. What does that mean? An exception means that you can copy the work and you can actually even make it available to the public if you are doing it in the context of specific uses or for specific purposes. Which purposes? Look at the shopping list. Private non-commercial use, copy for libraries, museums, and archives, ephemeral broadcasting registration, reproduction in prisons and hospitals for socially oriented users, or exceptions for using teaching and research. I can copy and communicate to the public articles if I'm doing it to teach you some, or I can do it for research. Libraries can digitize their collections and make them available on dedicated terminals. You can make accessible copies for if you are a person with disability. You can reproduce and communicate to the public freely without asking the authorization of the copyright holder articles of economic, political, and religious interest. Or you can quote a work for criticism. You can make parody of the work. You can use it for public safety or in judicial and administrative procedures. You can copy and communicate political speeches, conference excerpts. You can use works during religious or official ceremonies. 
you can you have freedom of panorama so you can take pictures of, of buildings and sculptures that are placed in public places you can freely use works to advertise exhibitions or sale of work of arts or to demonstrate the feature of a specific uh, device or to repair it and you can copy minimum part of a work if it is just in a material world so as you see there are purposes mostly connected with freedom of expression or freedom of press or, or informatory purposes, socially oriented users and so forth, which are considered to be so worthwhile that you don't want them to be controlled by copyright owners. So what do you do as a legislator? You say those uses can be done without asking the authorization of the copyright holder. You don't have to ask anything. You simply go ahead. You cannot be prosecuted for it. This is the approach we have in the European Union. In the United States, and the same applies to all countries following the Anglo-Saxon model, so also the United Kingdom has more or less the same, Australia, South Africa, and India, for example, so all countries belonging to the Anglo-Saxon tradition, they have what is called fair use. Fair use is a clause that instead of giving you a shopping list of uh, instances in which you can freely use a work, they give to judges a clause, a sort of balancing set of criteria to evaluate whether a use is actually fair. What do I mean? That when a judge is after, after, afterwards com, confronted with an infringement uh, procedure, he can, the, the person who's charged of infringement can raise the fair use defense. So can say, my use was not violating copyright but was actually a fair, non-authorized use of the work. And in order to evaluate whether a use is fair or not, they have a look at four main criteria. They have a look at the purpose and character of the use, the nature of the work protected, how much you copied, how much you used it, and the impact of your free use on the market of the work. All these criteria are balanced one against the other to define who wins, the fair use or the copyright holder. So it's much more flexible. It's true that it gives more uncertainty because it's not a clear cut case, but it's just a criteria that is applied by someone. But still, that means that judges are much freer to balance between conflict and interest, looking at the policy reasoning behind copyright protection. Now, we went through exceptions, we went through rights. Now, just briefly on moral rights. I told you at the beginning, but let me mention it once again clearly. Copyright has two phases, at least in the continental world. When you own copyright, you, just don't, you don't just have economic rights, but you also have rights that are connected to your personality. So they are personality rights. They are not monetary. They are not patrimonial economic. They are personality rights. That means that they cannot be sold. They cannot be waived. They cannot be transferred you cannot renounce to them. And in several countries, they are even perpetual. Those are the rights to be recognized as an author, the right to paternity, the right of integrity, so the right to oppose any modification, the formation, mutilation of your work, which might cause prejudice to your own and reputation. You have the right of first publication, so you should decide whether or not to publish your work. And you have the right to withdraw the work from the market if you don't recognize yourself in that work anymore. So you don't want a work associated to your name to circulate anymore. These rights cannot be transferred, are perpetual, so they can even be exercised by ascendants, descendants. And I tell you, there are states like Italy and France where actually those rights survive even after the expiry of economic rights. So they might be exercised by the Ministry of Culture if there is a public interest behind that. And that happened, for example, against the mutilation and the adaptation of uh, the miserables of Victor Hugo. In France, the Ministry of Culture intervened to enforce the moral right of integrity on a work, even if Victor Hugo didn't have heirs alive, it can't enforce it anymore. Now, moral rights are not harmonized internationally. You have just some reference in the Bern Convention, but also, if you look at what happens after the digital revolution, they are slowly disappearing. 
there is less and less interest in moral rights. Copyright is more and more becoming something industrial, something mostly economic. So we still have moral rights in the continental environment, but that's something that it's becoming basically demodé, quasi outdated, I would say. How long does copyright last? Well, internationally, the minimum is 50 years after the death of the author, 5-0, PMA, post-mortem authors. But in most of the countries of uh, Western legal traditions, I'm referring to Europe, I'm referring to the United States, it's 70 years, 7-0 after the death of the author. It basically covers two generations. Specific works like non-original pictures or cinematographic works or certain works non-published by the author, and, and I'm not entering into too many details, have different expiry dates. The basic uh, black letter rule is 7-0 after the death of the author. So this means that author's right can be exercised long after the author is dead. Now it's time to actually show you uh, how you can transfer these rights. Then I will show you out of commerce and orphan in five minutes, and then we will close with uh, academic publishing. So again, just snapshots. These were the basics. Once you have this right, you can do two things. You can sell it or you can license it. If you sell it, then you transfer it forever. It doesn't come back like you do it with a flat. If you license it, you allow someone else to do specific things with your work to read it, to copy it, to transmit it. You can decide what is the content of a license. It's a free contract. It's not, it doesn't have a particular type of content. Now to transfer this right in countries like Italy, you don't even, even, you don't even have to be 18, you can be 16. You should do it in writing. And actually it, you apply to these rights, all those rules that you would apply on any other economic right, expropriation, transfer upon death, possibility to use it as a security if you want to secure a loan and so forth. What you should remember, however, is that there are several countries and now even in the European Union is in this way, where authors are protected against publishers. Authors are considered to be weaker parties. So several copyright acts contain provision to protect you against publishers by determining in a fixed manner what your rights and what your obligations are vis-a-vis -vis the publisher when you sign a publishing contract. These are mostly um, rules that refer to publishing books. So not necessarily journal articles and the like, but it's important to know that depending on the countries where you are, you are protected by specific rules to balance your weaker balancing, uh, sorry, weaker contractual power against the one of publishers and distributors. These are, for example, rules that tell you that the contract should last a maximum of certain years, that the, that the amount of royalties you are paid should be renegotiated in case uh, you were paid too little and the work had a lot of success. That's called bestseller clause in Germany. And now it's also a European Union rule. Publishers have duty of transparency. So they should tell you how much money they made in selling your work. They should keep you abreast of everything that is happening to uh, your, uh, your work. They should ensure timely uh, printing and distribution. They, if if they don't comply with those rules and if you don't, they don't publish as you want the work, you can come out from the contract and so forth. So in general, uh, what you need to remember is that different countries, different rules, but the bottom line is that authors are protected by specific protecting clauses in the law against the stronger bargaining power of publishers. And this applies also, or I'll bait to a little, extent, so to a lesser extent, for performance and performers vis-a-vis -vis, uh, theater owners and the like. There are other aspects which might be interested mentioning, but I don't want to bother you too much. Works of art, for example, 
authors have the right to still get a percentage after all further sales. Why? Because if you produce a painting, it's not like a book that might be printed in 100,000 copies. You just sell your work of art once. So the only way for the legal system to keep on giving you some money out of your work is to ensure that you get a percentage of the proceeds of any further sale of the work until 70 years after your death. So if a, a painter uh, produced and sold a painting, he's entitled to get a certain percentage of the price of the second, third, fourth, fifth, and whatever sale of the work until 70 years after his or her death. That applies to transfer, full transfer of economic rights. As I told you, there are licenses, which are usually what you use to transfer your rights to others. And licenses are shaped as you want, so they don't follow a specific pattern. Now, uh, before moving to uh, ownership of uh, academic products and uh, Creative Commons licenses, and if there is still a couple of minutes open access, I want to give you some snapshots of what the European Union did until now to make sure that this amazing amount of rules protecting exclusive rights are actually balanced to other interests and particularly the interest in preservation of cultural heritage and access to culture. What do I refer to? Digitization of library collection. The Court of Justice of the European Union intervened in 2015 to stretch the exception of digitization, granting the possibility to libraries to scan, so digitize their collections as a prerequisite to make it available on dedicated terminals. The very same provision was introduced in 2019 and now is harmonized all across the EU to allow all cultural heritage institutions to do like what Google Books did privately four years before. So digitizing their collection and making them available to the public in dedicated, uh, safe, safe, secure environment. It's still a narrow provision because we are just talking about preservation and not about access, but still it's quite a remarkable step forward. The same Court of Justice of the European Union extended the exception for public lending, which allows libraries, archives, and museums to lend their works to patrons without paying compensation for authors. They extended this provision also to electronic versions of the same works, like ebooks, saying that the um, public interest reason behind this exception is the same in the material and digital environment. So now what you have is digitization for preservation and lending also of electronic uh, formats and electronic format words. But what the, court, what the European legislators did in the past uh, 10 years was to make sure that copyright didn't hinder access circulation of works which for which you cannot really trace the author or which are not published anymore. Because the problem was basically that by not having a right holder in case of orphan works, or by having works on which publishers were sitting and they didn't have the economic incentive to publish anymore, those works were basically unfoundable. Think about how many times you, in your research, you, for example, got desperate because you wanted really to reach a book from 1930 and you couldn't find a single library having it, or if there was a library having it, it was so far that the interlibrary loan was far too expensive and long and whatever. So there was a clear obstacle in having either no right holders, like cases of orphan works, or cases where the work was not published anymore for quite a long while, which created barrier to access and preservation. So what the European Union did, and I just tell this to you without entering into too much details, but for your own knowledge, was to introduce new exceptions to make sure that cultural heritage institutions can now digitize, for example, all those works, books, reviews, newspapers, 
cinematographic or audiovisual works, phonograms, and so forth, when no holder of copyright has been identified after a diligent search. So if you cannot track back uh, the author of those works, so you don't have anyone to pay in order to get a license from, then you can go ahead as a cultural heritage institution and you can digitize those works, making them available to the public. What you can actually do as well uh, now, after the wipe of Marrakesh Treaty and the related uh, uh, directive, is that you can reproduce and communicate to the public and distribute works in accessible format for people with visual impairment. Before it was just a disabled person who could do uh, an accessible copy for him or herself. Now there are authorized entities who can do this and distribute it if they comply with certain requirements. Finally, tackling the problem of not having accessible works for people with visual impairment. The uh, exception now is mandatory, and we finally have all across European member states, and in all states, member of the Marrakesh Treaty, actually quite a decent number of countries across the EU, these exceptions, which is increasing access to knowledge, and making it possible also for developing countries to get accessible copies produced in developed countries for free. So there is also free circulation of those copies for the benefit of the right to culture of people with disabilities. Last but not least, out of commerce works. Works on which basically publishers are sitting and they don't have any economic interest anymore in publishing. This caused always very high transaction costs to get license from those publishers. Those work were not circulated anymore. It was a mess for access to culture and particularly for preservation of culture. Now for long, uh, member states, thinking about Slovenia, Germany, France, uh, they tried to introduce systems for which this out of commerce works could be automatically licensed uh, to libraries or to publishers in order to get more diffusion. But there was basically no standardization for long uh, until we finally reached, and I go fast here now, the MOU I skip, uh, we finally reached the point where in 2019, the European legislator decided that it was about time to introduce a scheme to facilitate the uh, new commercialization distribution, so access at the end of the day of this work. What they did was to introduce an extended collective licensing scheme. So you have collective license, uh, co collective society, collecting societies, sorry, uh, managing these schemes, so um, managing licenses on entire categories of works, also for non-members of their organization, to license uh, for non-commercial use, cultural heritage institution, out of commerce work, so that they can digitize it and making them available to the public. If in a country there is no collecting society managing these licenses and not being representing enough, then cultural heritage institutions can actually use an exception and go straight to digitize and make available out of commerce works to everyone. So either they pay because there is a moderate in price collective license to be used, or the visa and exceptions. So not only orphan works, but now also out of commerce works can be digitized and made available to the public by cultural heritage institution, which increase access much more than before. Okay, so if there are no questions or comments and clarifications related to the part I did until now, I would conclude this class with some brief reference to the ownership and the economic exploitation of academic works, and if possible, also a bit to open access. Question, comment? I see in chat, probably there is something. You want to know what is the difference between uh, uh, copyright and the droit d'auteur? That's, I made some reference, but very briefly. 
So copyright and royalty author are two traditions that stem from the very, very same tree. So because originally until the 18th century, exclusivity all looked the same. At a certain point, the system got split. You got from one side the French tradition, the droit d'auteur tradition, which basically now covers all continental civil law countries. So all European countries and those coping from them, like ex-colonies, for example. And uh, the common law tradition, the copyright tradition, the main distinction between the two stands in the fact that the droit d'auteur tradition has moral rights and puts at the center the author and conceptualize the author as the owner of a right that is mostly a personality right. Copyright is there to protect his dignity, to protect his reputation, to protect the link between the work and the author. While in common law, in the copyright tradition, what's important is the incentivizing function of copyright. Copyright is there for the one single utilitarian reason, to increase the number of works published and distributed. So you incentivize by giving exclusive rights, by giving a monopoly of profits for 70 years after the death of the author. Who cares about the personality of the author? We care about the public need of having, the public interest in having more works out there, accessible and distributed. So that's the main difference between the two systems, which you see in the fact that one system has moral rights and the other uh, hasn't uh, moral right. One system has a closed list of exceptions because copyright, because what other dominates, while the other has a fair use clause to balance these utilitarian reasons when they clash with each other and so forth. So that's the basic distinction between the two systems that is actually still existing. And you saw it in the overview I provided on, and that's the reason why I actually showed you the US as a counter uh, example, as a counter ale to. Um, to the French tradition, which was mirrored in Italy and in the Europe, and mostly also in the European Union. Question on co-authorship and copyright with interviews. So the authorship lies with the interviewer. Can the interviewed person claim co-authorship of this work? The answer is no, because the author is actually the person who developed the interview and jotted it down. The maximum which the interview, interviewee can do is to oppose the use of certain speeches, the use of certain phrases, but not on grounds of copyright. Different is the case when I make a speech. If the speech is not public, the transcription of the speech can be protected by copyright. But in most of the countries, and this is something which tells you the way how certain topics are regulated, the transcription of public speeches uh, is subject to an exception. So uh, me as the speaker, I cannot prevent other people from transcribing and actually using the work. There won't be copyright over that work. It will be in public domain. There might be copyright on the work embedding the transcription, but that's not a pair of hand. Uh, but at the same time, me, and that's yet another specification, me, I can retain the right to collect my speeches and to publish them in a collection as the author of those speeches. Same applies to the interview of a public person. So see, it's always a check and balance between different needs. Hope it suffices. I see the thank you very much. So I, I hope that that was enough. Of course, it was just snapshots here and there once again, but we can, if you have more curiosity afterwards, we can even take it offline. But briefly on ownership and economic exploitation of academic works. So when you say paternity, you don't say ownership. The fact that you are the author doesn't mean that you are the owner. That's something which you see more in patterns, like if you are an employee, your employer retains the ownership of, your, of the inventions you developed in the context of your work by, in the context of your job description, and by uh, using facilities of, uh, of your employer. It's not the same in copyright. In copyright, this doctrine, the work for hire doctrine, so the direct attribution of uh, copyright of the works produced in the context of an employment contract, they are not directly transferred to the employer. But usually, usually, that's 
object of an employment contract. So usually when you enter into an employment agreement uh, with someone, there is always a clause that, that imposes the transfer of the economic rights of the copyright protected works you generated in the context of the work to your employer. What happens to researchers? Well, that depends on the country where you are. If, you, if we talk about Italy, there here you have the humanistic privilege, which means that all the works you are generating as a researcher uh, in the context of your work remain your copyright. If acts and publications were developed uh, on the university money, the you know, university has the right to retain the uh, exclusive rights on the work for two years, and then it moves to authors. But that's a legislation that is just Italian. If you move to other countries, then you have different rules like retention for three years, uh, uh, pre, pre, um, preemption uh, in case of licenses, uh, so option rights for universities. So there are different settings that are used uh, to make sure that universities don't spend money on projects and they don't get anything back. But generally, the basic rule is that either the work is commissioned or copyright is retained by researchers. And that's the reason why researchers are those always engaging in the license to publish agreement. If you are an academic, for sure, you sign this contract. I don't know how many times. It's typical of the Anglo-Saxon tradition. And they force you to recognize, to sign a set of standardized clauses and models. Generally, they make you retain very limited rights, like reproduction in personal works, using teaching, using in your collections. Otherwise, you basically grant to the publisher, exclusive license that is perpetual, without geographical limitations, multiformal, transferable, you swear that you didn't infringe the copyright of anyone, and very rarely they provide that you can actually distribute in full open access your work. Otherwise, the maximum you get is the so-called self-archiving clause. So you get an embargo and then you can, for example, publish the preprint, or release the postprint after a certain uh, lapse of time. That's the basic setting. So this means that what you can actually do with your own work after your work is published doesn't depend on you anymore, but it's based on this license to publish agreement. And this is what distinguishes, and I don't know if you covered this already in other uh, sessions or not, green from gold open access also. Uh, the basic difference between the two uh, platforms is that the green open access is a, a possibility to freely publish, uh, to freely disseminate on repositories your work without paying anything. But this should be actually allowed by the license to publish. That might be subject to different uh, conditions. It can be just a preprint file or the postprint file with or without embargo. That's something which you generally can check either in the license to publish agreement on in particular portals like Share Palomeo. I can enter into more details in the discussion if this part was not covered in other sessions. But unfortunately, the most spread system up to now is the so-called gold open access, either pure or hybrid with authors processing charge and uh, transformative agreements, which means that you pay to have it open. So not only you are the one providing the content, not only your university is the one paying the databases to have access to protected works, but you even need to pay to have your work in open access. APCs are quite tough. I don't know what your experience is, but for me, usually to publish an open access uh, article with the gold with the gold open access rule so that goes up to a thousand five hundred euro per piece, which is a lot in terms of money. Books make a range from six to nine thousand. And of course, that's something which is very heavy on universities, even more on researchers. You now have what is called transformative agreements. So um, universities enter into agreements with publishers. And if they already signed license agreements with those publishers to get access to their uh, products, databases or eBooks or hard copies of books, then Publishers grant so gently to uh, employees of those universities a certain number of free open access opportunities. 
they, 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 they are negotiated usually at the national level and uh, they are distributed among universities in reduced number. That was something that was heavily subject to uh, discussion because basically what, we, what they generally say is that that's what um, that, that publishers are doing double dip. So from the very same, uh, from the very same entity, the university, they get money to publish in open access and they get money to access proprietary works. So works that are behind, beyond, behind uh, uh, paywalls of proprietary databases. Of course, when you want to publish uh, open, you have uh, different opportunities, different model licenses. The most common are Creative Commons. I, I imagine that you met them some when they are based on the GPL software license and they were born in the early 2000s. Uh, depending on the type of uh, license you select, you allow people to do different things with your work. So depending on this very, uh, very strange acronym, uh, you are actually attributed to uh, users different prerogatives on your work. For more information, you can directly go on the Creative Commons website. They explain the content of this license uh, in detail in very layman uh, words, so even non-lawyers may perfectly understand this. Um, uh, since it's uh, 3.20, I would actually not go into detail of the open access movement and the EU recommendations on it. And I will stop here because uh, I would like to give the floor for questions, if any. Thank you very much for your attention and for bearing with the speed of this very dense presentation. Thank you very much, Katerina. Very, very clear presentation, very comprehensive. I think we, yeah, I, I really appreciate and I have to say, I'm sure uh, our public uh, enjoyed a lot. Um, and uh, I see there is a comment in the chat uh, about the answer you gave um, uh, concerning interviewing. So Anna Inkret is saying in social sciences, we are very careful to collect consent for interviewing. Without consent, they can never be shared. So I would definitely say that the interviewee retains some rights over what they say. Same for recordings, voice is subject to GDPRs. Of course, you can comment on that. Of course, but let's not forget that not any object you have out there, you don't just have one type of rights. You may have several layers of rights. The fact that you have GDPR rights that are privacy, right, doesn't mean that you have copyright, which is another set of rights. So what you're stating is absolutely true. That simply means that there are three layers instead of five layers of right on the same object. An interviewer, an interviewee can say, no, you don't share my interview, or they can ask you to pseudonymize the interview, or they can ask you to anonymize the interview. But the publication, the copyright, which is the right to economically exploit the content of the interview, is something else. Your original way of articulating the questions and interpreting the answers, it remains your own intellectual creation. If it matches the requirements which we discussed on copyright, they will trigger the existence of your copyright. But your copyright cannot, when exercised, violate the privacy rights granted by the GDPR uh, to the interviewee. So GDPR rights win over copyright. But be careful with this. Don't mix the two. I know that if you're a no lawyer, that's not easy to understand. But it's like if you would have two actors or like two different forces, one win over the other, but they don't mean that they are the same. One takes advantage over the other, one wins over the other, but they are different rights. And they are triggered by different laws and they have several different requirements to be activated. I hope that was clear, but if you have any other doubts about it, feel free to showcase them and I'm happy to follow suit. 
Okay, so I see Anna is thanking for the explanation, it was very clear. Is there any other question for Katerina? Because I have one question, <laughs> but I would prefer to open the floor to the public. So if there are any other questions, please. Okay, so I, I have this question, which is about European projects. So in the model grant agreement is uh, required now for Horizon Europe, uh, which is similar to Horizon 2020, but there are some changes. So uh, now it's not possible to give away my copyright. So I must retain my copyright hmm, uh, before publishing. Uh, when publishing, not before, while publishing. So the issue is, you said that in Italy, uh, in, in most uh, cases, the copyright is uh, not of the author, but uh, of the institution uh, which hires the author. So for instance, I work at CNR, normally, uh, it seems from what you said that the CNR, I, I should check what is the policy of CNR because I understood it depends on the institution or I don't know, but I, it's not clear to me uh, how to deal with different um, systems and requirements. Uh, in the case I'm working for an institution which asked me to uh, um, give them the copyright or and uh, on the other side i have another institution saying you must retain for your own the copyright so which is the in this case because i'm paid by my institution while working for a european project so i'm not hired by the european commission and so what is the most uh, important legislation, the prevalent le legislation in this case? That's a very interesting question because uh, it uh, sheds light on the fact that uh, several internal regulations of universities will now need to be revised on the basis of the new requirements of Horizon Europe, for example, because they are outdated and they are not compatible with the requirements of Horizon Europe. In general, uh, the law, uh, I'm talking about Italian law, but that's quite the same all across the EU, doesn't attribute to the university uh, economic rights. So the copyright is retained by the author on the basis of what is called the humanistic privilege I was referring before. But there are specific cases where the work is commissioned by the university or is fully funded by the university, where the university may retain options or economic rights for the first two years. That's something that is allowed for university to do. Universities can do it. But for example, that part is not necessarily in conflict with Horizon Europe because Horizon Europe refers to what is funded by Horizon and not what is funded by the university. Generally speaking, uh, in what it's the most problematic part is, as I said before, the regulations of several universities, because I can even mention you examples of Re internal regulations that are to integrate the contract you actually don't have with the university because in countries like Italy you are like just invested from the power of the king to get to be a university professor you don't even have an employment contract but what regulates the content of your uh, IP rights and the ownership of your IP rights stays in uh, your uh, Mm, internal university regulations and some of them are not compliant with the rise in Europe and they will need to be and anyway uh, that is going to prevail because in terms of hierarchy of sources uh, internal regulations cannot prevail over requirements that are actually stemming in some cases from uh, EU regulations that are higher in rank. I don't know if that satisfies your yeah Thank you very much, really. And uh, so I see there are no other questions. I'm going to uh, conclude with a very short uh, survey about uh, 
this uh, webinar. Uh, I hope you can see my screen and the Mentimeter code. So please uh, uh, connect to Mentimeter, www.menti.com and uh, insert the, the, the code uh, you are, uh, you can see on my screen. And uh, let me check. And we have uh, very few questions uh, about this training session. First one, if you enjoyed it. See numbers increasing. Thank you. So I can go to the following question. We would like to know if this training session met your expectations. I see that the public is uh, very happy about it and Thank you very much for answering. And then following session about uh, a question about how you felt. Thank you very much. It's very important for us to have feedback on this uh, training events. And then I think this is the last one. The topic was relevant to your work. Copyright is a very, very important topic and issue we have to deal with and Although we are not uh, lawyers or experts in law, it's really uh, important for us as researchers to be able to deal with all these very complex and let me say fragmented issues related to, to it. So yes, and there are no, there won't be uh, uh, upcoming uh, uh, sessions, so I think we can close with this uh, this last uh, question. And so, thank you very much again to Katerina and to you all uh, for being with us today. And uh, I really hope uh, to have the chance to. Yeah, organize something else in the future about open science and related issues. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice much. afternoon. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.